Good morning, everyone. Isn't it great to be in God's house this morning? You know, I am grateful that God got us up today, aren't you? Grateful that you're on this side of the grass. And I couldn't help it. Uh, God does make beautiful things. God does create new and old. Behold, I am doing something new, God says, oftentimes in Scripture. Behold, I am going to redeem and restore, oftentimes in Scripture. As Pastor Luke was singing that song, I was reminded of Psalm 51. And as we enter the sanctuary today, and as we open the Word, and as we look to God, continue to look to God. I wonder if these words strike you. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy. Somebody say joy. Joy. The joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit. I want to invite you to a moment of reflection. How have you come into the sanctuary today? Are you asking God daily to create within you a new and a right and a healthy and a balanced and a connected spirit to Him? Are you asking for God to be present in your life? I would invite you to take a moment and seek the Lord. He's close. He's close today. Jesus, we are thankful today that you've chosen us to make us a royal priesthood, to call us to be your own, Father, to be light in a world filled with darkness. So Jesus, in these moments, as we open Scripture, as we worship, as we praise, as we listen, as we seek you, Father, we ask that you would draw near to us. Scripture tells us that if we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. Help this to be a sacred and holy moment. Lord, have your way. Help us to continue to choose you. Jesus, it's in your name we pray. And everyone say with me, amen. amen. We're going to be in Titus chapter 2 this morning. Titus, Titus chapter 2, starting with verse 11, uh, verse 11 through 14, which in the Greek is only one sentence. And it's one sentence that I think is so theologically profound that I'm so grateful that Paul wrote it. And he put it in Scripture, and we get to read it today. And it, and it reminds me of this grace of God that goes before us. Aren't you grateful for God's grace this morning? Anybody in the room? I half believe that some of you are grateful for God's grace this morning. We would not make it another day if it would not be for God's grace in our lives. We would not have salvation today and eternal life and the hope of heaven without God's grace in our life. You see, God, aren't you glad he takes those ashes and he makes them beautiful? Aren't you glad that God takes that brokenness and he restores it and he pieces it back together? We, like cracked pots, are put back together by God's grace and he takes that dust and he creates something from nothing. You may have walked into the space today thinking, Pastor Greg, I have nothing to offer God and I want to tell you that as a lie from the pit of hell, you're here today. God's grace has gone before you. We're going to look at that article this morning. God's grace is drawing and wooing and helping you cooperate and be a co-heir with Jesus. So even if you feel like I walked in the sanctuary today and I've got nothing, God's grace says you've got something. So turn to your neighbor and say, I got something. Good, I'm glad you got something. You see, because God can take that old ground and he can till up that old ground. It's been raining a lot up here and create something fresh and spring up hope. Is that not what we just sang? Aren't you glad that God doesn't hold your sin against you? 
that He doesn't give you sin's penalty because of His grace? Aren't you glad that God chooses to make you new? That God creates the space for you to respond to the gift of salvation. You didn't do it. You didn't earn it. You didn't make it happen. You may be sitting in here today and you don't think it's very important, but I would offer to you that I think it is vitally important. You see, in John 14, Jesus promised a helper, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, the intercessor, is always going to make a way, as Pastor Pam said last week, for people to say yes. Have you said yes to God recently? We're going to talk about provenient grace today, purely Wesleyan term. This idea that God is drawing and wooing, this idea that you're in the process of being sanctified or you're being pulled to be saved, and God creates that, you can choose it or not. Yet in that creative state, you have the opportunity to say yes to God. Today we continue our series in Reconstruction. We look specifically at article number 7 in the Nazarene Church's faith about provenient grace. This is a distinctly Wesleyan Arminian understanding of how God chooses to draw us to himself. And when I think of grace, I'm reminded of my mom. Hi, mom. I made it on a live stream. <laughs> I'm famous, mom. I'm grateful for my mom. And I would offer to you today that had it not been for the faith of my mother, I would not be standing behind a pulpit today. If it hadn't have been for the prayers of my mom, someone who modeled grace to me, I wouldn't be standing before you today. I think of how graceful and nurturing Lisa is and how much patience she has with our three kids. And sometimes I don't have that same patience. I'm thankful for other moms and grandmothers and adoptive moms and grandmothers in the church who took me underneath their wing and they said, Greg, God's got something great for you. We believe in you. Keep living and walking with God. Keep giving your heart and your life to God. The Bible brings many understandings of the constructs of grace. There's irresistible grace that you can't resist, potentially. There's cheap grace, common grace, no grace. We even sang about amazing grace. But today we're going to talk about, anybody guessed it? Provenient grace. So turn to your neighbor and say, provenient grace. I'm glad you got it. This was first coined by Augustine in the early 5th century as an operative grace or a cooperative grace. It was later picked up by Arminius and continued in the teachings of Wesley as provenient grace, preventant grace, the grace that goes before, a grace that is primarily an operation of the Holy Spirit. Through the dynamic power of the gospel, it can dispense faith, it convinces or convicts of sin, it can warn of judgment, it's a knocking with an invitation, an offering eternal life in exchange for eternal judgment. You see, when a sinner repents and submits to God and stops saying no and instead says yes, please save me, then the Holy Spirit indwells. It's no longer on the porch, it's no longer on the outside, it empowers from within, it comes into the life of the believer. We read in Titus chapter 2, starting with verse 11. If you would stand with me as we read God's word together. Titus chapter 2, starting with verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared that offers, somebody say offers. offers. Key word here in this passage, that offers salvation to who? All people. Now I want you to hear very clearly from the beginning. Not some people. The Nazarene church believes every single person. Acts 2.21, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be, what? Saved. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself up to us, for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own. 
Let's pause there for a minute. God has called you to be a person of his very own. Eager, of course, we're in Titus, to do what is good. You may be seated in God's presence. Eager to do what? What is good? Which is a summation of the book of Titus. Eager to do what is good. We can do good because God is good and God is working for the good and God calls us to the good and God models good. And so therefore, in our present age, we can do good and great things. But I would offer to you, we are able to do these things because of the prevenient grace that God offers. The first thing I read in verse 11 is that prevenient grace is enabling but can be resisted. If you read in verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Provenient grace is enabling, but can be resisted. I had you say the word offers. God offers it. God doesn't demand it. God doesn't say it has to be that way. God doesn't appear and you have no other choice but to say yes to God. According to Wesleyan, Arminian, and even Augustinian understanding, we are a chosen people who are choosing. Somebody turn to your neighbor and say, I'm choosing. Anybody remember that old hymn, I have decided to follow Jesus? No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I I will put a word there and choose to follow. That's provenient grace. God appears. You know what, God? I want a piece of what you're offering. Yes, God. Yes. I will say no to the world, and I will say yes to you what you offer to me. It's not a grace that comes in and says it has to be this way. It reminded me of Revelation twenty two seventeen. The spirit and the bride say, come on. And let the one who hears say, come on. Let the one who is thirsty come on, and let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. Did you hear that? The free gift. Choose to choose God. To choose a free gift, a life that's offered, a hope that's offered. Provenient grace is enabling but can be resisted. Provenient grace being the grace that goes before us. Notice the order of salvation here. It is offered and then you have the choice. It's almost like Romans 5, 8. God shows his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Provenient grace is simply the convincing, calling, enlightening and enabling grace of God that goes before conversion and makes repentance and faith possible. Our article of faith in the Nazarene Church actually says, we believe that the grace of God through Jesus Christ is freely bestowed upon all people, enabling all who will turn from sin to righteousness. Did you make that choice today? Has God called you to turn away from the world and turn to righteousness? It reminded me of another great old hymn, I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delights, things that are higher, things that are greater, those have allured my sight. And then the chorus says, I will hasten to thee, hasten so glad and free, da, 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 da. Jesus, greatest, highest, I'm coming on over. Do we still have that resolve today in our church? Do you, Christians, still have that resolve today for Jesus Christ? Are you resolved that you will not be charmed by everything else or anyone else, but you will give your all to Jesus Christ? That to me, that enlightening, that enabling to the grace of God that goes during salvation (laughs) is the gift that Jesus offers through provenient grace. See, Wesley compared provenient grace as the porch on a house. It prepares our hearts and minds to hear and receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's been offered, and it's like you're walking up to this house, and when I, when I picture a house to be more descriptive, I think of those old Victorian houses with the big wraparound porches. 
I've not seen a whole lot of those up here. Is that, is that a southern thing? I've seen some, but you know the ones that they wrap all the way around. And I, and I think as you're approaching this house, as you approach any house that you're unaware of who lives there, there is some timidity to walk up to the porch. But I think there's also some comfort level to at least knock on the door if you have a reason to be there. And Wesley brought provenient grace as this idea of being on the porch with God. And when I think about being on the porch with God, I think of a rocking chair. I think of me and God sitting there with a spring breeze blowing through, and we're having a conversation. He would go further to say that he believed that justification was when God knocked on the front door, and you chose to open the door and let him into your house or not. And it brought a whole other thought process to me. See, the provenient grace of God is enlightening. It shines light. It's enabling. It allows you to make a decision. It allows you to choose to trust God or not. It also made me think of the opposite. What do you open the door to your heart to? Are you opening the door to your heart to salvation? The salvation that God offers? Or have you opened it to other things? And if you've opened it to other things, I still believe, we still believe, that the prevenient, preventatent grace of God is still drawing, is still calling, is still wooing, is still pulling, is still asking, is still pleading, is still interceding on your behalf to make right choices that God has convinced or convicted you of. So the first thought was in verse 11, prevenient grace is enabling but can be resisted. In verse 12, I read these words in verse 12, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Prevenient grace is transformative, drawing us to Jesus and away from the world. Somebody say amen. Okay, I... I felt good about that, amen. amen. Provenient grace, the Holy Spirit's work in your life, is transformative. I can't think of a more Wesleyan doctrine than the idea that even past salvation, even once God has pulled you in and you've given your life and taken that first step, that provenient grace remains there, that God's Holy Spirit remains there and continues to make you aware of how you can choose to be godly. Is it easy to be godly in our world today? I don't think so. We've got more than we ever had. We've got so much that we could just log into and see and things that we could go do. And, and everything's available to you today, Christian. But I want to remind you and ask you a holy life, a life that you've submitted and surrendered to Jesus Christ is still calling and it's still transformative. One of the thoughts I've had about sanctification is it never stops. Anybody agree with me? Are you still in the process of being sanctified? Thank God I'm not who I used to be, and I'm not who I want to be, but through God's grace, I'm going to be who he wants me to be, and I'm going to keep walking that path and keep surrendering my life and keep surrendering parts of my life, and when the Holy Spirit, the provenient grace of God, creates that space for me to respond, I have a choice. Yes, God, I want more of you, or no, God, I don't. You see, it wasn't too long ago I remember growing up in a church where people would always talk about the work that God was doing in their life. I've even served in some churches where Brother Billy would get up and he would stand in the middle of the pew and he'd say, Pastor Greg, Billy was 80-something years old, and he'd say, I've got to tell you about what God's doing in my life today. And before we knew it, we had a service that morning. We'd worship and read scripture, all because someone was so infused and so infilled and so working with God in the power of God and the Holy Spirit that they couldn't help but testify to what God was doing in their life. Provenient grace is transformative, and it draws us to Jesus, and it pushes the world away. Now, grace by itself, we would define as unmerited favor, right? You've heard this before. But provenient grace is a supernatural enablement and empowerment for salvation and for daily sanctification. 
Christian, let me ask you a real direct question. When was the last time you sought after God and you surrendered yourself to what God wanted? Some folks in our Nazarene churches have wondered why we don't have the power that we used to have. And they talk about the glory days. And I would like to think that we're in the glory days and they're going to come back. But you know how they're going to come back? It's that daily death to self. Daily yes to God. Daily listening to the Spirit of God. Trusting God that you will continue. He will continue to move and create in you a new and right, as we read in Psalm 51 earlier, way of being. You see, grace is everything for nothing to those who don't deserve anything. And grace is what every person needs when none can earn what God alone can and does freely give. Provenient grace makes you aware that God is offering so much. Our Nazarene article of faith says that we believe on Jesus Christ for pardon. Pardon's not a word that I think we hear a lot today. Anybody ever been pardoned? The, the illustration that comes to my mind is the last time I got a speeding ticket. And I had to either pay the fine and I had to go to court, right? But there's been a few times, not many, <laughs> But a few times, I'm, what are you talking about? I'm sanctified. I've never sped anywhere. Uh, but when I went to court, I had to be pardoned. And the pardon took the debt that I owed away. I owed it. I caused this to happen. I broke the law. And so I had to pay the debt of breaking the law. But grace offers a pardon. Something we can't own. We believe on Jesus Christ for pardon and cleansing from sin. When I read this this week, it reminded me of the process that I'm going through up here. And it made me wonder, Christian, when you hear all these words, when you hear all this doctrine and this theology and you read Scripture, do you ever read it and think, does my life even measure up? Has God cleansed you of sin? Is there a difference between original sin, something that the Scripture says you're born into, and personal sin, something that you decide to do? And how do we define sin? Well, in the Nazarene Church, we define it as 1 John 3, 4, lawlessness against God, a willful transgression against a known law of God. See, the Holy Spirit sheds light on those dark crevices of the heart and somewhere along the line, I think sometimes we get this idea that cleansing of sin is only a one-time event in salvation. And I think what I want to offer to you is a continual pursuit of God shows more and more of those dark crevices, and you have a choice to be sanctified or not. You have a choice to give your heart to God and trust in Him or not. You see, when we do that, to those who respond to that preventative grace, the grace that saves you, somebody say saves, the grace that sanctifies you, somebody say sanctifies, the grace that sustains you, somebody say sustains, that will eventually glorify, somebody say glorify you, and the image of God, somebody say restored, it's restored within you, you're going to see clearly God in what God is can do in what God is doing. You see, 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, what we see now is not clear, but a time will come when we don't need a mirror. We will see everything clearly. Praise God. Praise God. Anybody? Praise God. From whom all blessings flow. Praise God. All creatures here below. Praise God. I, I don't know about you, but when I start thinking about how God has drawn me to himself and given me the choice, it gives me a, a whole new level of freedom, of admiration, of readiness to stand up and say, you know what, I know a creator of the universe who's got something better in mind than what I see in the world. The last thing I read in this passage is provenient grace is for everyone, we've said that, but it is not universalism. So universalism is that really nice, fancy phrase that 
everyone will be saved by the grace of God regardless. In the end, the grace of God will win out. There's actually churches, uh, the Unitarian Church is one of those that would profess this. And what's also interesting is in church history, we, we have had these multiple views of hell. We've had multiple views of how grace works. And I'm not going to say that I've got it all worked out. What I would offer, though, is I very much believe God gives you the choice to choose him. You can choose him or not choose him. And I think Scripture is pretty clear, and Jesus has different words, where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth for those who don't choose him. But I'll let you decide. But I believe that provenient grace is for everyone. It's not limited atonement either. Limited atonement is that God's grace is only for some. It's some are eternally destined to be saved, and others are eternally destined to be damned. And the Nazarene church, we don't believe that. It's for everyone. So what that means is the Spirit of God goes around before everyone. Everyone has the choice. Every person you encounter either chooses God or they don't. Yet every person that you encounter is someone that God still loves. And when I think about how the Holy Spirit moves and works, and when I think about preventative grace, and I think about that drawing and wooing, I wonder... This week in your life, if you were so surrendered to God and you were walking daily there and you had this great sermon come to mind because it was excellent and you were like, yes, Pastor Greg, what would it look like for you to listen to the Spirit of God when you encounter different people? And I wonder how God would lead you. I wonder if God would prompt your heart to share part of your story, how you came to know who God is. I wonder how God would lead you. You see, provenient grace is for everyone, and, and I believe that God has partnered with us so that everyone would know. Grace comes from, excuse me, faith comes from hearing. In verses 13 and 14, we read that Jesus has offered us this to prepare himself a people. And what that says to me is not for everyone, a people. And then, of course, I took it to Hebrews and others, a royal priesthood, a group of disciples who are ready to do what? Good work. It is that God stepped into your story and brought you out. God stepped up and made a way. God helped you to see when you had no vision. God reached down into the pit of despair and strife, and he made something beautiful in your life. God offers this to everyone, but not everyone chooses God. We're chosen people who are choosing. What's interesting is, I'm going to tell you where I got that phrase, a chosen people choosing. Uh, I work with a rabbi at ATA, and I just asked Rabbi Brown, I was like, hey, Rabbi, I'm curious. Does the Jewish faith have anything like provenient grace in it? Or are you just chosen and that's it? And he said, actually, Greg, we are chosen but we are choosing. I was like, oh, I really like that. So then I also work with a Catholic priest, and I asked Father Ben. I said, hey, does, does the Catholic Church, and your understanding, is it limited atonement? Can you choose? And Father Ben goes, oh, it's definitely a choice. I said, oh, okay, cool. You know, I like, I like this idea. One picture that really sums up this thought for me. Anybody remember the story of the prodigal son in Scripture? Yeah, how do you think the son knew he could go back to his dad? It's not explicitly said in Scripture, so I'm inferring here. But I wonder if the son knew he could go back to his dad because he knew the kind of grace that his dad had. As the worship team comes up this morning, I want to call you to a response. And I wanted to do so with Scripture the scripture simply says, choose this day who you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I wonder, as you've heard a message about provenient grace, God drawing you for pardon, for cleansing of sin, for good works, pleasing and acceptable in his sight, which is what our article of faith says, the grace that saves you, it sanctifies you, it sustains you, 
will eventually glorify you and when you'll see the image of God fully restored within you. Who are you going to choose? Do you choose today to trust in God? Or do you choose to do something else? Are you tired of the something else? 